I have an interview that I'm going to do with um, Sarah Smarsh. Uh, she wrote a brilliant piece in The Guardian uh, last week, and it went viral, and so I couldn't get her until this week. I mean, everybody wanted to talk to her last week. I couldn't get her until this week, uh, but it's about how the media has failed the working class, and it, it dovetails into this election, obviously, and Donald Trump, and a lot of the things that we've talked about previously with regard to um, Donald Trump supporters, um, the white working class, and the erasure of... I mean, just across the board, right? I talked about the erasure of um, black people uh, for the purposes of, you know, for the purposes that I won't outline again. Um, but in her piece, she really talks about how white progressives that are in the working class have been erased. Uh, so we'll talk with her about that. Um, and actually, I have her already on the line. Uh, what led you to write this article and kind of give me the backstory before we delve into all, some of the specifics? Sure. Um, well, basically, I'm a native of the the white working class that you were just talking about at the top of the show, and um, so, and I also am a professional journalist, so I'm kind of uniquely equipped, maybe, to be sensitive to whether the mass news media gets um, narratives about my home place uh, right or not. That's not to suggest that I somehow represent um, everyone in the white working class as kind of precisely what I was writing against, mm -hmm. the idea that that's a monolith. But at any rate, I, I felt like they were really kind of getting the narrative wrong. And what specifically? So okay, actually, you know, um, some of the things that jumped out in the article for me, one, you, you, you use the context of your family, a family member who uh, caucus for Bernie, if I'm not mistaken, voted for President Obama twice, considers um, herself to be a progressive and considers herself to be completely opposed to what Donald Trump represents. But when you have the narrative of uh, that's being woven by the media, it kind of just completely erases the fact that you actually have um, white working class people who are both progressive and oppose Donald Trump versus this picture of all of Donald Trump supporters are white working class. Ah, uh, and uh, you, it sounds like you're saying something. It looks like you're saying something great there, but uh, there it is. Here we go. Go ahead. Start over for okay. me. Okay. You got me. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, the family member that you were talking about, uh, that's my, my grandma. She wouldn't use the term progressive about herself. I'm from a, a pretty, um, a, a family and a kind of place that really um, isn't terribly politically engaged most of the year. And they're out in like working in wheat fields and in factories and not part of a real um, national political discourse. So she might not use that term about herself, but it's def but progressive definitely is what she is, and she has always embodied those values. Um, and and so this election year, you know, she's appalled by Donald Trump, and as are many members of the white working class I know. Um, you know, in, in t you mentioned her votes for Obama. In 2008, 42% of Kansas, uh, I don't know how this shakes out class and race-wise, but 42% of my home state came out for Obama. And uh, when we're so fixated on the Electoral College and the way that we cover politics, um, that whole group of people suddenly is invisible, even though, in my opinion, 42% ain't nothing. And so, um, but what I was really wanting to do with this essay is to show that, of course, there are Trump supporters among the white working class, but they're not his quote unquote base. Um, recent studies have uh, shown that his supporters actually have slightly higher median incomes than the national average, slightly higher um, education levels than the national average, and so on. So. I'm really suspicious about that narrative, and I, I have some ideas about why it prevails in the in spite of the numbers. <laughs> right, um, and that's kind of what you you went into in your article. So you 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 say um, you say the faces uh, journalists do train the cameras on hateful ones screaming sexist vitriol next to Confederate flags must receive coverage, but do not speak for the communities I know well. Uh, you continue to say that the media industry ignored my home for so long that it left a vacuum um, of understanding in which the first glimpse of an economically downtrodden white is presumed to represent the whole. Unpack that for me. That's right. I, you know, I think and that we could say this of any group of people uh, along any demographic marker. If, if you've got a, 
a faction of the American population that uh, doesn't usually get news coverage in terms of their issues and what's going on their main, going on, on on their main streets, um, then you know I'm not necessarily suggesting there's some sort of classist mass conspiracy in the media. You know, I think it's just if 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 anything, it's like a a kind of obliviousness on the part of. Uh, wealth privileged and, and of course also a race privileged uh, media and so um, so yeah that uh, that dude that is uh, wearing the horrifying t-shirt that says something bad about women and he's waving a confederate flag and spewing racial epithets he's real and he needs to receive coverage of course um, but I think that you know there's two two, two twofold what that narrative misses. One is that there is racism and misogyny and xenophobia um, yes. present yes. in the middle and upper classes as well and they are also you know giving Donald Trump lots of money and staying quiet in their socially conservative white suburbs and they're not showing up and waving flags at rallies but you know those stories should be told too. And then also um, the other thing that is missed, as you said, is is the many people I know who are white workers who um, would die before they cast a ballot for Donald Trump. And a, a lot of them were for Sanders in the primary, actually. So they're kind of like on a the other end of the populist spectrum. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're we're actually like talking in two different uh, two different silos here that um, that you dealt with brilliantly in your article. One, you dealt with this. Uh, you actually have an entire section: um, poor whiteness and poor character, um, where they uh, make draw an equivalency, um, even if not directly, they indirectly draw an equivalency between character and poverty. And the less money you have, or the less wealth that you have. Um, it they shine a light on the the negative aspect of that community, uh, making it seem as though if you're poor, you have no character. And you said this. It said, I love this line. You dropped the mic here. Um, I assure you that none of us had to go to college to learn basic human decency. I love that line. Absolutely. Um, the other thing that we're dealing with is the the reason. Right. You're unpacking the reason this happens. And you're, you're saying that it was it's not necessarily a class conspiracy as much as it is obliviousness and um, a certain amount of privilege. What what else would you attribute it to um, or would you just unpack? Like, why does this happen? Why is it such a persistent theme, despite the fact that uh, Donald Trump supporters are wealthier? You know, the median income for Donald Trump supporters is seventy two thousand. But we lay it at the feet of the, the quote unquote working class. Yeah, well, I think one, any group, um, you know, as racial minorities and, and all sorts of groups in this country know well, all too well, anytime you have a group that, that isn't represented um, d um, proportionately in newsrooms and for that matter, who whose um, voices just aren't heard as much in general due to all sorts of systemic imbalances, that group is going to be um, vulnerable to, to scapegoating and mischaracterization. So, um, you know, I think that's one part of it. And then I think that uh, sometimes there there is some real overt judgment and contempt on the part of middle and upper class whites toward um, lower income whites that, as as you were pointing toward from my essay, equates, let's say, um, lack of college degree with some sort of just ignorance about basic human decency. And, and um, that's, you know, just... Um, uh, that that's blatant classism. Now, I would say that uh, you could also have an entirely well-meaning reporter, and and I want to say that as a member of the news media, I, and I'm a proud to be a journalist, and I think that the the industry um, takes a lot of crap, especially at, at at the present moment for supposed conspiracies that don't exist. Um, that that said, I think that sometimes it's even a well-meaning reporter um, if tasked with going into a space where um, he or she holds biases that are, you know, have been fostered um, by culture and society, maybe, you know, by no fault of the individual, then those biases are going to come out in the way that a story is reported. Mm -hmm. So let's unpack some of the um, some of the outcomes of this right we can't lay this completely at the feet of the media but they 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 own some of this problem right and some of the outcomes being this um this mischaracterization of an entire class of people 
counter to the evidence showing that Donald Trump supporters are wealthier, right? That's one. And then the other is you have um, this continuous theme through America that uh, wealth equals some type of moral virtue. Um, what are some of the other downsides to this type of trope that is constantly cast? I mean, I have a few, but I want to hear from you. Like, what do you think are some of the other effects that we see or maybe not are even aware of? Uh, well, I would say that, you know, if we're at a moment of, um, you know, just real political peril and high stakes in this country, which, you know, is everyone's aware of in different ways and from different angles, I think that any time that the media kind of fixates on the most sensational story that is um, not only damaging to the way that the country sees itself and can navigate political discourse together, but it's also kind of um, irresponsible to its role as a watchdog for democracy. So, so I went into the industry because I see the you know reporting's virtue as like um, you know uh, uh, speaking truth to power, shining light where um, where a story isn't being told, and so on. And if you've got a, a mass media that is by and large driven by uh, profit-seeking mechanisms and business models, then that means that like the um, the most egregious and horrifying B-roll, that being like the tape, tape that rolls while an anchor or reporter is speaking mm -hmm. of, say, the some, some image that represents a divide or a, an extremist view in our country, that's a really dangerous way to approach covering, covering um, current events. I can give you an example from my home state. Um, uh, so uh, Kansas is unfortunately home to uh, the very notorious Westboro Baptist Church, so-called. Um, it's much less a church than it is a, a hate-mongering cult, of course. But, um, you know, so Fred Phelps, their kind of patriarch, um, and their uh, crew has been around for a long time. And coming up in Kansas media, I learned that... Um, the journalists, good newspaper and TV reporters in Kansas all kind of have this unspoken pact together of like, we, we get that this um, hateful sect very skillfully wants to and will use us and manipulate us as a platform for their message. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's a it's a tough line to walk because you you also have to cover the news and and you don't want to like um, turn away from the horrifying extremist aspects of the country. But I think that um, the national media just got played so hard by Donald Trump and some of that includes the just kind of um, rating through the roof ratings appeal of the the Trump rally and all of the all that it represents which to my mind is an is an extreme minority of this country um, and so now we're left with this sort of um, um, perverted view of the nation as though those people speak for all of us or at the very least for the white working class and I don't think that's accurate. The article is entitled Dangerous Idiots How the Liberal, Liberal Media Elite Failed uh, America's Working Class, Working Class Americans. Um, it's by Sarah Smarsh. It's in The Guardian. I've been talking about it for the last two weeks. Sarah, thanks so much for joining me to talk about this. You were, uh, It was hard to lock you down, but you promised you would do it, and thank you so much for joining us. Hey, I'm honored to be asked. Thanks so much, Benjamin. It was a pleasure. Now, tell uh, real quick, it's just kind of a tradition here. Tell everyone how they can get up with you, uh, like your Twitter handle or whatever, however you like to get contacted. Yeah, I, I would love for folks to um, uh, look me up on Twitter. It's Sarah, that's S-A-R-A-H underscore Smarsh, S-M-A-R-S-H. And I also have a Facebook page that's easy to look up where I kind of post stuff behind the scenes of the essays that I'm working on. Um, and my website with a lot of my, if, if folks like this essay, this is the kind of thing I've been writing about for several years. And there's some stuff they might also enjoy at my website, sarahsmarsh.com. Thanks again for joining us, Sarah. Thank you so much. Awesome. 857-600-0518 if you want to join the conversation. Um, I definitely recommend reading that article, um, the, the essay. It's really a brilliant take, and um, 
it's definitely worthwhile. It actually dovetails right into the other half, right? So she's addressing the issue from um, the liberal media drawing a picture of the white working class that creates enmity, right? It paints them all as racist. Um, I pick up the other side where I say the liberal media, the black liberal media is painting this crowd as uh, racist and they're painting them all as, you know, Donald Trump supporters when in actuality there's a very large group of white progr- uh, white working class voters who, even though they may not identify as progressive as Sarah mentioned, they definitely voted for Obama. They voted with Bernie Sanders and they have something in common with African-Americans, um, uh, with, with a lot of African-Americans, not all African-Americans, right? Uh, Cause there's no monolith. Um, but it reminds me of the Saturday and Saturday night live sketch of, uh, um, that just happened this weekend with Tom Hanks and, um, where it was black jeopardy and they were asking questions and it was, you know, obviously a Saturday night live. So it was, you know, you can't really draw a lot from it, but there was something to be said there where they were showing all the commonalities between like a Donald Trump supporter and, and African-Americans or basically like a, a, a white working class, right? Voter uh, and African-Americans. And there were so many things that we had in common until we got to a particular issue. That's the, that's the uh, particular issue of black lives. That's the picture as funny as that was and as accurate as it is for Donald Trump supporters, that's not all of the white working class. And, and I think uh, what it does ultimately, um, I don't buy into conspiracies, but I do buy into divide and conquer. Uh, it's very easy to keep um, working class people divided using race.